studios in New York City. This is Charlie Rose. Michael Boyd is back. He has been the artistic director of the Royal Shakespeare Company since 2003. When he took over, he promised to knock Shakespeare off his pedestal. His sense of what he calls the duty to experiment has turned the company around and won him critical acclaim. He will step down from his post in 2012. I'm very pleased to have him back at this table to talk about the complexity, the challenges, and the genius of William Shakespeare, all part of our series, Why Shakespeare? Welcome back. Lovely to be and here. Since you were here, you've announced you're leaving. Yep. It will be 10 years next year. And, uh, of course, I thought about whether to go for a, a third term, as it were. Mm -hmm. And I, I just felt that I, I would like to spend some time in a rehearsal room with, with no queue outside the door. Um, mm -hmm. And also that it was time to hand, hand the opportunity on to someone else. There are other, there's a great generation of British directors coming through. And I think one of them ought to get a go at running the RSC. Well, I'm, you know, the speculation is wide. Everybody from Kenneth Branagh to, to Michael, which is in Grandage, is... Uh, yes, uh, that's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a good list. So well, they're, they're good people that are ready to step yeah, in. There are some very good people who uh, are colleagues of mine at the moment. Rupert Gould, who's yeah, an indeed, associate director. Indeed. Gregory Doran, yeah. who's yeah. chief associate. There's a, there's a terrific field and some, some really good women directors as well. Um, when, when you look back... This is a chance for you to sort of say, this is what I intended to do and this is what I did. I wanted to reassert theatre as a collaborative art form, the right. ensemble. Right, right. That was principle, wasn't it? I mean, this yeah. idea that we'll have a group of actors. It was partly idealism, partly wanting to experiment with artistic community, uh, believing that that was what theatre has over film, that that the work happens in the space between us um, uh, in, a, in a wonderful uh, collaborative way in that way. And, and, and in some ways it was just purely pragmatic. Stratford is in the middle of England, very badly served by public transport. Mm -hmm. You can only make theatre on retreat there. So it's the perfect place to trap artists and keep them there for three years, mm -hmm. taking their art form seriously. And what else? Uh, internationalism. Mm. Being much more outward looking, we moved just before I took on the job from a, a theatre in London called the Barbican, which means a fortress. Right, right. And I didn't want us to be a fortress. Yes. And both in the complete works of Shakespeare Festival a few years ago and next year in the, the largest performing arts festival any time, At the time anywhere, of the Olympics, the World Shakespeare Festival, we are inviting artists from Brazil, Mexico, Russia. The United States, the Worcester Group, are co-producing Troilus and Cressida with us. Um, to enlarge our theatrical vocabulary and to welcome them to learn whatever we might be able to give them. Uh, I think that, that outward-looking curiosity, that determination to see Shakespeare as our contemporary, to look at him are fresh every time with the naivety of a child and, and revisit him, not just retread the old the old rails did you knock him off his pedestal well we we've produced some remarkable contemporary pieces of work mm. well when i mean knock him off his pedestal it's partly the campaign to produce the next shakespeare and in dennis kelly the author of our matilda which opened in london um recently and is uh, coming to new york next year uh, I think we've produced a major piece of, of, of lyrical work. In the work of David Gregg, we have as well, over the years, three marvellous plays um, from him. In the other sense of knocking him off his pedestal is stopping seeing him as a sacred cow, mm. stopping seeing him, stop celebrating him as some nostalgic view of, of, of what Englishness used to be and, yeah. and, and yearning back to it but actually to open him up and see what's living in there, what's dangerous in there, what's vivid still today. He can today. be a contemporary figure? He's appallingly contemporary. Appallingly contemporary? Well, just in the green room, I was listening to your previous guest talking yeah. about what's happening in Syria and yes. Afghanistan, and the, the Shia-Sunni split yeah. is dramatised and still alive in Shakespeare's work. Him having living in an England still shaking from the revolution of the Reformation between where the, the new Protestant rulers have, have, have more or less um, 
illegalized Catholicism, which, which was the religion for ages in, in, in Britain. And uh, that conflict runs through Shakespeare's work like the print in a stick of rock. Yeah. You also said once that if to say, for, for people to say if it's not in the text is not terribly creative. I think the text has always got to be the starting point. Um, partly because one of the... All the text? One of the, one of the most important bits of magic about Shakespeare is that he was... Before he was writing, before print really took over, he himself spelt his name probably about 15 different ways. Mm let alone all the other words um, in his work. We've got very little manuscript of his, but his spelling is appalling. What was regular, what he knew about, was the sound of words, the embodied quality of the words. So his text is not meant to be read. His text is, is a noise. Mm -hmm. You can't say some of his lines without smiling. You can't say some of his lines without bringing a violence into the air. It's, it, it, it's very, very concrete. But... I think if you satisfy yourself with a purely scholarly view, if you treat Shakespeare purely as archaeology, then he will feel dry and dusty. Mm. Um, just as I think in the classroom, we shouldn't teach children sitting down, reading the text. We should put the desks to one side, get them up on their feet, and yeah. start very early as well. Start them in elementary school. Don't leave it till later. Don't patronise them. It, but there's also this thing called maximal text, isn't it? My, I'm not sure that I know what Max. Yeah, but I mean, it's means. the idea that that Shakespeare was meant to be whittled down. Ah, well, we the, the best record we've got of his plays, the ones that are probably closest to his fullest intentions, are the, yeah. is the Folio. Right. But we also have different versions of probably derivative of, of prompt copies that are maybe closer to what he was actually allowed to perform. Yes. <laughs> and maybe for the best. Uh, he talks about Romeo and Juliet. Well, because of being, time or because, because of... Because of time. The yeah. prologue in Romeo and Juliet says the two hours traffic of our stage. And uh, there are a lot of <laughs> Romeo and Juliets that last longer than two hours. And maybe it is because each time it was actually performed there was a, a whittled down text. Maybe it was because the performers and the audience were in a very close kind of union that allowed very fast speaking mm. and that the performer, what they wanted in the theatres was that the performer was ahead of the listener, not, not the listener going, yeah, got it, got it, got it, hurry up. We do, I think we do indulge sometimes, particularly with the psychological readings of Shakespeare, in, in a very slow, mm. lugubrious delivery and... I, I suspect even the long text would have taken a shorter period of time in Shakespeare's. When you life. have a director that you have hired because you know they have skills, mm -hmm. do how do you tell them to approach it? Do you say to them, "Don't be too reverent about Shakespeare. Uh, be prepared to be creative about it. Be make Shakespeare alive." Don't. I'm not usually starting. I'm lucky at the RSC. Lots of people want to work there. Yes. So I'm not usually starting from first principles they've with directors. They've done it before. I, they, they, I will know, yeah, they've done it a lot of times before, yeah. probably, and I will know the kind of approach that they might be taking, and I, uh, therefore I, I will let them get on with it. And then there comes a point where maybe a run-through in a rehearsal room or a preview in the theatre or during the dress rehearsals mm -hmm. where I will go and just be a fresh pair of eyes for them. Yeah. Um, but I... I hope over the last 10 years I've run quite a broad church from deconstructionists to uh, very recognisable, quite traditional but beautiful yeah. interpretations. Um, and I probably sit somewhere in the middle. You, you're in the middle. Yeah. yeah. Who are the inheritors of Shakespeare? I think contemporary filmmakers. Um, I think... The, uh, the contemporary rappers in terms of verse, yeah. the, 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 uh, someone like Jay Z or Nas uh, or Eminem are, are they, they inherit one part of it? Yes. That extraordinary quick fire, highly organised, very sharp, very witty, metrical rhyming language, brilliant. Um, in terms of consciously addressing the whole of society. Yeah. It's the movie makers, really, and the television 
um, uh, 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 drama. People who makers. are doing great drama on television. Yeah, yeah but but they they have they there's something missing there that that, that maybe Jay Z doesn't at a live concert. He's in direct contact mm. with his mm. audience. Um, well, what about playwrights? Whereas filmmakers and play, playwrights are the direct descendants, right. um, obviously, and they are aware of the dynamic between stage and auditorium. They're aware that a play only happens in that space between the stage and the auditorium and that they are addressing a live community. And that's something that architecturally we've tried to reflect in our in our new Royal Shakespeare Theatre that is mm -hmm. that is consciously a community gathered around the stage rather than us performing in one lit mm -hmm. space and the audience sitting in another dark space over there. And playwrights for the theatre are able to respond to that. You don't get answered back at all in, in, in the movies. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's an element that's it's missing. It's kind of pedantic, isn't it? Well, it's not necessarily that it's pedantic, it's just the means of production are miles away from the audience, thousands of miles for most people, away from the audience. And so the kind of dialogue between the people that are being talked to and the talkers is a, is a more sterile one. Mm. Yeah. But here's what's interesting, and we said at the beginning, you know, I mean, Shakespeare demands to be relevant by the breadth and depth and, and uh, focus on the kinds of things that will be part of a society forever. The politics, the revenge, uh, the conflict, the, I think the, the establishment the, versus... Yep. The reason Shakespeare's still alive is that he couldn't help being relevant. He wasn't trying to be exactly. relevant. Yeah. He needed himself to explain the world around him to himself. He needed to explain it to himself. He had you no think he wrote for himself. There's a wonderful piece of advice that a celebrated actor gave to would-be actors. Um, I can't remember who it was, but he said, "Don't do it unless you can't do anything else." Exactly. And yeah. I don't think Shakespeare could do anything else. He, he was an okay actor, uh, but but really, the thing he could really do was write. And there was an urgency. There was a real need. The audience needed it too. For it to be, it needed it to be relevant as well, and uh, there was that visceral communication between a writer and the audience at that time. Too many of Shakespeare's contemporaries fell into the trap of of being polemicists, essayists, mm -hmm. um, agitators, um, teachers in a way. Shakespeare, in order to stay alive and out of jail, kept the drama and the explanation of what it's like to be alive in the face of mortality and the abuse of power, um, he kept it all within his plays, within his to be or not to be, uh, should you oppose or, or should you just, and, and, and therefore risk your life, or should you let it be? How should we best behave? How can you deal? Another uh, uh, tremendous re relevance of his work uh, for us today is the appalling polarization between amorality, rampant immorality, and a rigid fundamentalist ideological puritanism. That, 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 those, that we're being driven into a choice between those two, and Shakespeare tries to populate the human land mm. in between. How did your Russian experience shape you in terms of, of as a dramatist and as a you know, a Shakespeare, Royal Shakespeare Company director? I, I think maybe the most important thing was witnessing how urgent theatre was as an art form in the 1970s in, yeah. in, in Soviet Moscow. Um, that the, the, not only were, were people sort of queuing around the block and all the theatres uh, fantastically full, but you couldn't, for instance, you couldn't produce Ibsen's Enemy of the People under that, under that title because it would be read as an attack on, on, on the government, uh, ennobling uh, an enemy of the government. Vrag uh, naroda uh, in Russian is, is the phrase used to denounce people who were uh, uh, not, uh, dissidents, really. Um, so, and, and particularly actually see, in terms of Shakespeare, seeing Russian work on Shakespeare... I had not realised before how urgent 
he was, how urgent Hamlet was seen, dealing with this corrupt state dominated by Claudius, that figure becomes so important for an Eastern European audience member uh, at that time. Uh, empathizing with this man, trying to take apart an unfair, dangerous world and behave with integrity and effectively within it. And how do you do that? And nobody dramatizes that better than Shakespeare. And, but that's clearly what we saw in the Arab Spring, which we continue to see in the Arab Spring. Yeah, and we're... And, and we're, that's what you meant in the opening remarks about the segment that we did about Syria. We're, 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 we're working um, with uh, a, a wonderful group of Tunisian artists um, who are doing a production of Macbeth, very much set in the last days of the last regime in Tunisia. Uh, we've got, we're working next year with the Iraqi theatre company from Baghdad on Romeo and Juliet, and Sunni Shia is Montague Capulet. Uh, it, this is great. It, 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 it's just there. We're doing a Much Ado About Nothing with all the, the pressures around marriage and honour and chastity uh, set in the Punjab with British Asian actors um, who have long regarded Shakespeare as their artist much more than their white Caucasian fellow Brits. Uh, they, they, they've long regarded him as uh, a, 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 absolutely a, a soap opera writer of their lives and we're celebrating that next year which is great. Uh, Sam Sharma has called him, the, the, I think he said, the greatest language enhancer of all time. Well, he invented a great deal of, uh, a great number of words. Um, invented words. He chose words to he, use that he, nobody he, had ever heard before. Yeah, he, he joined words together, used them in a new way, um, in, enriching the vocabulary, uh, finding, finding new ways of talking. Mm. Uh, good poetry, good poetics comes out of a, a need. How can you say this that it, so that it's absolutely on the button, it doesn't get you in trouble, mm. and it is memorable, not just, not just for the audience, but also practically for the actor as well, because they didn't get a whole script. They just got their cue lines, and they got very little time to rehearse, actually. I've made a big fuss at the RSC of lengthening rehearsal times, partly, again, from my experience in Russia, witnessing what was possible with more preparation time. But in Shakespeare's time, I have to admit, they whammed it on the stage very, very quickly. So the mnemonic power of Shakespeare's language is a very pragmatic thing. But, you, but you're saying by lengthening the rehearsal time, uh, your actors became more in command of the language? They become more in command of the language. They, have, they are, after all, dealing, unlike Shakespeare's own actors, they're dealing with a, a language from... Well, it's almost like a foreign language right. now, 17th right. century right. English. Um, they have more time to find each other out and actually more time to eventually start directing the play themselves and make the, the director redundant. Mm. Um, I re some of my happiest times in the rehearsal room have been working on maybe the fourth play with the same company, um, the fourth play in a row, and beginning to realise that they, they have found it. They've got the language. They're, they're mm. almost... The, the production is writing itself. Um, One more reason to have an ensemble company. Because of that depth of understanding, because mm. of the courage that's possible. When... You're not worried about embarrassing yourself. You've already done everything embarrassing you possibly could in front of all these people. When you know, you, you know what kind of shape of thing to throw at that person, it's not the same thing as what you want to throw at the other person because you know them as people as well as as artists. What does a great director do when he's introducing Shakespeare? Uh, I mean, uh, obviously, language is there's an, an issue. extent to, uh, to which uh, I, I will prob uh, probably be very inarticulate about this. It starts, I think, with a hunch, some hunch great. about about a play, a hunch. Say M Macbeth, yeah. um, uh, which I've directed recently. There was a hunch that the play shouldn't be that unlucky, oh. and that led me to really get interested. 
to be really precise about it, in the England scene and in uh, a little bit about King Edward, the confessor, that's cut from every single production you're ever likely to see except mine, this last one. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the sacred, saintly king of memory, the, the one sainted English king ever. Um, and I... I, I found, I, I followed my hunch that there was a candle in the darkness in that mm. scene and I started reading up about him. I discovered that the, 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 the miracle that qualified him for, for sanctity in Rome, they, you have to apply for sainthood, yeah. and the miracle that qualified him was having a dream about a tree that was dismembered and then reassembled and it had miraculous powers. Uh, he woke up from that dream according to the application to the Vatican and ordered, uh, 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 I think it was an oak tree, to be dismembered, moved 30 yards, and then regrafted. And that tree was accorded um, mir miraculous powers. People, it had healing properties. And that suddenly made a sense for me that I'd never seen anywhere else about Burnham Wood coming to Dunsinane. It was a miracle. It was a natural miracle that was born out of Malcolm's time spent mm. with King Edward the Confessor in England. And that actually the play is quite redemptive. That there is a redemption at the end of Macbeth of sorts. Now, you had never seen that before in, no. in, in the, no, I think in the theatrical, inside of a director, never before. Theatrical tradition, I think, has wallowed in the darkness in Macbeth actually quite irresponsibly. Mm. Um, footering with evil, like with a Ouija board, and... I, it didn't mm. feel Shakespearean to me. He's a, always goes to the darkest places, never leaves his moral responsibility at the door, always goes to those dark places, trying to be fully human, trying to be good. And Let me understand this. Going to the darkest places, trying to be good, meaning? In the face of despair towards the end of King Lear. Yeah. Everything goes appallingly wrong at the end. Uh, Edgar says, um, you know, we haven't reached the worst. Well, still we live to say this is the worst. Um, it, it gets worse and worse. He loses his father. Shakespeare changed the end of that play from his source material to kill Cordelia off at the end, whereas actually she lives uh, in his source material. So is he just, is he just dragging us into despair? No, he's not. He's not trying to gloss over our mortality or the brutality of regimes and the unkindness of man to man, the inhumanity of man to man. But he, in the case of Lear, comes up with humility and love. Paternal love, romantic love is his answer. Or he comes up with the injunction to us to... I think it's perhaps his most important one instruction to us is to see feelingly when Gloucester loses his eyes. We, we hear oh from him God, that he yeah. sees feelingly. And shake, that's... Sees what, feelingly. Sees feelingly. And what that's about in Shakespeare, I think, is not being a smarty-pants theorist or rationalist looking clear-sightedly for the solution, but to feel your way through. And in the end, the solution is always, is always love and humility. Um, but he's not, Shakespeare's not interested ultimately in what we think. He's interested in what we feel. And in the feeling, then is contained the contradictions that are inherent in Shakespeare that keep the drama alive, that keep his plays alive. What kind of contradiction? The contradiction that runs through every aspect of Shakespeare. Yeah. The country boy, the city boy. Um, the, uh, the, the, the one who uses the high courtly language uh, of, of the romance languages of Latin and the one who uses crude Anglo-Saxon. Um, the, the Protestant boy whose father was probably a Catholic. Um, the man who probably had 
a sexual ambiguity about him as well. Mm. Constantly in two places. The man who had twins and lost one of them. There is a duality about Shakespeare's work, which in the end is the DNA, uh, encapsulated most famously in To Be or Not To Be, mm -hmm. uh, that makes him like an unstable atom, still generate energy for us now, um, whenever we go and really look at what he's saying and what he's doing with his plays. Do you find audiences in different places, different countries, react differently? Or T tremendously, of course. Um, based on their own experience and what they bring to the theatre. Yes, when I did Troilus and Cressida in, in uh, Tel Aviv, it yeah. was very different from doing it in a nice suburb of London. Yes, indeed. Very different. Yeah. Uh, conflict was... It, it was... It was just straightforward. It was water on a parched yeah. piece of grass. Um, whereas perhaps... People who, do, who are not living uh, in a, a dreadful civil war, like in a, a, a war like in Troilus and Cressida, are, are trying to work their way towards an understanding, uh, and another audience comes to it, and, and they just go, yes, yes, of course. Mm. Um, and audiences behave and feel their way into a piece differently as well. Um, I mean, there are cliches about British Reserve and uh, right, right, right. American open-heartedness and all the rest of it. Uh, Russian audiences are, are perhaps the audiences that I've seen best for reading the puzzles in Shakespeare, because Shakespeare did wrap himself up in puzzles. Yeah. Um, the Russians, with all their, well, we don't believe what they say, so what are they really saying? Their, their, their habit of decoding anything yeah. said in public... Um, Immediately, I like ducks to water to the puzzles in Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. We're going to see some scenes from Hamlet, which I, I, I know you have directed Hamlet. And, and when, before we, I show you these scenes, when you directed Hamlet, I mean, what, what was your operative eye sense of, of what you wanted to, how you saw it? A hunch there was... Because you said it starts with a hunch. My hunch with Hamlet when, when I, I, I staged it was that it was unfair to Hamlet to call him a ditherer um, or to say that it must be the result of some problem with his mother. Uh, the delay in killing Claudius. My hunch was that it was actually quite difficult to kill a king. Uh, that it might well have been a devil from hell coming to tell him that his father had been murdered. It could be. Uh, he didn't know if Claudius had done it. There was no evidence whatsoever until Claudius stood up freaking out at the, at the play within the play, The Murder of Gonzago. Mm -hmm. um, and then he proceeds straightforwardly to, to kill him. He goes looking for him. He's distracted by his, his, his mother wanting to see him. But, he, but during, the moment he hears Claudius's voice, he stabs him. Unfortunately, it's not Claudius. It's Polonius. Um, on the, uh, he, he, he goes to kill him and he won't kill him while he's at prayer for fear that grace uh, will, will shorten his time in purgatory or stop him going to hell but perhaps unfairly take him to heaven uh, and then the full might of the state comes crashing down on him exiles him to England uh, for uh, judicial execution he escapes that brilliantly comes straight back to England in double quick time and as soon as the moment is right he kills Claudius so I suppose I was my hunch was a political thriller mm -hmm. not just uh, a totally internalized play happening with inside Hamlet's skull I like that uh, take a look at this these are three scenes uh, from the uh, famous scenes in between Hamlet and the ghost and we'll take a look at three different directors and how they chose to uh, direct and portray this scene here it is I am thy father's spirit doomed for a certain time to walk the night and for the day confined to fast in fires till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. Alas, poor ghost. List, list, oh list. Oh, go 
God! Revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. Murder! Murder. Most foul. As in the best it is. But this most foul, strange and unnatural. Haste me to know it that I, with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love, may sweep to my revenge. They were in chronological order in terms of production. Yeah. Hmm. Well, tell me what you saw when you watched that. <laughs> Interesting. There's a sort of tradition, actually, that, that all three are, 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 are fond of, of a quite a statuesque hmm. figure from beyond the grave, a stillness and a sadness in all, all of those. Stabbed through with an ugly violence in Ken mm, Branagh's, mm, right. with the blood coming out of right, the ear. Right. Um, the shock for the audience and the sense of unease at the time of seeing purgatory, which officially did not exist anymore in England, it had been declared uh, illegal <laughs> to, to, to think about it, that being placed on the, uh, on the London stage was was an extraordinary thing mm. this thing uh, th there are more things in heaven and earth than right, i dreamt right. of in our protestant philosophy in wittenberg horatio yes uh actually it might be true all those superstitions they might be true uh that must have been so shocking um but uh, it's lovely it's lovely uh, seeing a bit of david tennant's hamlet again he was... Ooh. You liked it? Yeah, very much. Very... I've never seen a, a sharper-minded Hamlet. You could almost feel his mind cutting the air mm. uh, as, as, he, as he dissected people and as he tried to cut his way towards the truth and then to action. You know, I went out to find as many as I could on video, and you can... I mean, David Tennis was one of them you can find. I mean, there are a whole range of yep. them. Yep. Uh, it's remarkable. I mean, if you really go searching, you can find a treasure trove of material. Again, um, the Russian Hamlet's tremendous. Yeah. Smoktunovsky, uh, again, in a context where it, it, was a very, it was a very politically important event, that mm. film. King Lear, how do you see that? What's your hunch? I don't know yet, which is probably why I haven't directed it. Um, but, but then how do you find it, you know, the hunch? You just have to wait. You have to wait. I think you just have to just, wait for it to... You, you absorb to as much as you can and then... Wait until you think there's... there's. You can just feel a little glimmering light in the bushes yeah. somewhere. You, you and begin then to you, feel an instinct. And then you, you, you go... It, it's interesting because, paradoxically, King Lear is my favourite play uh, on the page. The, the language, Shakespeare's language, by Lear and in Lear, is so stripped to the bone. Uh, and so powerful, so concrete, embodied, and dangerous and true. Um, and and the, and uh, but, but 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 he never loses sight of the soft humanity, the delightful relationship of the of, of the fool with Lear. Um, we're all in love with Cordelia for all her brashness at the beginning with with, with Lear. Um, I, I think, maybe crudely and clumsily, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking, oh, uh, you know, Lear, you've got to be, you've got to be old to do Lear, and so now that's now, crude. Do you think? Uh, yeah, I think it's probably wrong. Right. right okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's true at all. I think young people can imagine exactly uh, age just as. Uh, 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 an Englishman could imagine Italy in the English Renaissance. Um, I may, maybe Lear will be a production that I do when I do it, without a hunch. When will you do it? I don't know. But is it next up for you? I mean, is the thing that no, it's not next up for me. Next up for me is a Pushkin. Um, uh, uh, Boris Godunov, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a new uh, dramatisation of that written. It's the last thing the great English poet Adrian Mitchell wrote before he died. It was our commission, um, and it's not. we haven't done it yet. Um, and that's Pushkin trying to um, look, at, look at Russian history 
very consciously borrowing from Shakespeare's histories um, and looking at Russian history round about the same time as Shakespeare. So it's, always, so it's a wonderful piece. I have another video clip for you. I brought video clips. This is the, the, the uh, final the scene where Lear is holding Cordelia's uh, dead body. Here it is. Tongues and eyes, and use them so that heaven's vaults should crack. She's gone forever. I know when one is dead and when one lives. She's dead as earth. Lend me a looking glass, if that her breaths do mist or stain the stone, why then she lives. Is this the promised end? image of that heart fall and cease this feather stirs she lives if it be so it is a chance that does redeem more sorrows than ever I have felt yes sir he's my favorite favorite Shakespearean actor or favorite favorite Lear Lear certainly he did that for you yeah that was our production mm. um Really enjoyed the uh, the arrogance and the megalomania and the vanity of the beginning. Really understood it, <laughs> got around it, played with it, yeah. celebrated yeah. it, and very courageous in allowing himself to be stripped away by the end, but never leaving his tools aside always always taking his craft with him even when he was splayed as a, a as an artist for the for the audience not 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 forgetting the skills there's Lovely. there's some people i mean i think harold bloom may have said this um that he didn't think lear could be realized on stage you look think that's just silly i i'm not i'm not, I'm not sure you know, some some uh, scholars prefer reading the plays, yeah. and I, f fair dues, absolutely. It's fine. Uh, fine with you. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 I have no, I have no problem. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I obviously think they're misguided. Uh, yeah. I think I, I've seen a lot of really quite wonderful productions of Lear. Um, it is a play that I usually enjoy in the theatre. It's long, it's, it's tricky, it's not a cheery piece, um, but I, I, th I think it is. E each embodiment is, is going to be partial. Mm. The, the very notion that you can have the complete mm. capture of the play, I, think is, uh, I don't think it's a very useful one. And, and do you, I mean, some have said also that, that the, the play can teach us about knowledge and the price we pay for self-knowledge. Shakespeare never underestimates, he's never glib about the cost. The price you pay. Yeah. He's a, he's a tremendous... It's not easy. ...recorder of human pain. Um... And uh, and sometimes in the, in Measure for Measure, he's he's almost a sadist the way he makes the Duke play with Isabella uh, uh, and the death of her brother yeah. uh, to, towards it, delaying her, uh, well, forcing her to really believe that her brother has been executed when he hasn't, and delay, 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 delay. Now in that case, it's interesting. That's not very sh the, what the, the Duke's behaviour isn't that Shakespearean. I don't think Shakespeare would be quite that cruel, but he loves having someone that cruel to test someone in the fire. Yeah. And the people who come through their fires, uh, we adore. Like Edgar, who we, we find quite boring at the beginning of King Lear, but by the end, we love him. 
we've gone on a massive journey with him. Um, and he has learnt something from the fire. But Shakespeare's not a sentimentalist. We love him because he's learned? Yes, and without losing his huma hum humanity. Edmund has been mistreated before the start of King Lear. He has been mm. ignored because he was a bastard and is indeed treated uh, um, with, with, with callousness by his father in, in the opening scenes. But Edmund's reaction... To, to the scorch of pain is to be corrupted. Um, others, and, and to, to be in denial about his pain. Iago is in yeah. pain about imagined infidelities of his wife and, 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 and a frustration that he hasn't been as successful as others in the army. Um, but he, Edmund and Iago's reactions are to uh, pretend they're not in pain, pretend they can be in control of their pain, and to manage everyone around them. And sh that's shown to be uh, a disastrous way forward. Mm. Interestingly, between them, Edmund does find a glimmer of light at the end um, and tries to behave l l like a good man. Iago is left charging off into the darkness, refusing to say another word. He's a character that's just not finished, like Malvolio at the end of Twelfth Night. I'll be revenged on the lot of you. We never see that revenge. There's a, a broken arm at the end of that play of Malvolio's rage, and there's an unhealed wound in Iago's silence. Um, it's, it's, one, it's, it's associated with why Shakespeare went out of fashion for 200 years, um, that, that his place was seen as badly made, messy, incomplete, um, indecorous, vulgar, crude. I actually heard a brilliant young German director recently in London um, talk of Hamlet as a, as a really badly put together play. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> it's, not, it's not neat, it's not resolved. Yeah. It's not regular. Were those, those the things that he said, or were there other reasons? Uh, I think he, he 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 found it inconsistent. He found it um, he found it messy, and I, I the mess is and the contradictions. The, but the, you know, it doesn't stack up. The fact that it doesn't stack up is what makes it like life. Exactly. Uh, film adaptations. Have you liked one more than any other? Um, because of the actor, because of the play, because I think of my the my two my two favorite. I'm trying to think. My two favorite Shakespeare's on screen are probably the Smoktonovsky. I've got three: the Smoktonovsky Hamlet, and the Brook Lear, mm. um, with Paul Schofield. And this is Peter Brook. Yes, Peter Brook's um, uh, Lear and uh, Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. Those are probably my three that, 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 that I, I, I found really exciting. The Smoktonovsky, because of the high, romantic, real danger uh, and the sense of a, a palpably dangerous world. And the Brook Lear, it's, it, is part, it is just Paul Schofield. I, <laughs> I think I first, I first really got Shakespeare on a, on a, on a long playing record with Paul Schofield's voice. Um, uh, uh, and and that, that 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 sense of that language not being to be not being to be written down at all, yeah. it's meant to come out of the heart and yeah. through the mouth, and that's uh, was Paul Schofield's great gift. And Baz Luhrmann, for somehow making that play leap off the screen at you, yeah. um, really getting, really getting the religious side of it really getting young infatuation and passion and love, really getting the, the danger, the, the gangster danger of it. Mm. Um, and, and not again, actually, Baz not, not trying to tidy it up. Um, it, it was a loose cannon mm -hmm. of, a, of, a, of a film. Uh, Macbeth, do you like Macbeth? Um, 
Yes, I can't, I'm trying to think of... Well, actually, uh, in terms of films, uh, The Throne of Blood, fantastic. Yeah, right. Absolutely, devastatingly brilliant. Um, Is it true that actors have trouble with Macbeth or just a certain act of a certain performance at a certain time in his life? It's... I think it's a tricky relationship. Mm. Macbeth, Lady Macbeth. It's a, it's a very... Um, it's a, it's a very screwed up relationship. Uh, well, you, in, the one, relationship. in the one that you directed, she dominates, does she not? She dominated to start. Like, I think in the play, Lady Macbeth yeah, right. dominates to, to some extent to start with, and 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 there is this wonderful paradoxical turning point. Uh, Macbeth says, uh, "And Macbeth shall sleep no more, uh, yeah. because I've done uh, I've done this." Uh, uh, and she says, don't, don't, don't be silly, just wash your hands. And it's her that sleeps no more um, in the end. Whereas he goes on being very effective and uh, uh, killing the Macduffs and, and so on. Uh, the aforementioned Harold Bloom says it's the happiest marriage in Shakespeare. Yes, it is. Uh, in, in, it, it, it is in some ways. I think Benedict and Beatrice will be yeah. happier. Yeah, and uh, live a better <laughs> life. Um, just I immediately, I think Orlando and Rosalind. Uh, yeah. I, I would rather, <laughs> I would rather be one of them. Um, so I'm not sure it's the best, but they they have a very close understanding relationship. It's not. I don't think you can say it's happy. There is this question of this child that. Right. Uh, right. That, that Lady Macbeth has given suck to and that doesn't seem to be around now, um, that, that, that strong hint of a loss, mm. of a hole in the middle of them, certainly that was something that preoccupied us a lot when we were exploring it. Here is um, Lady Macbeth and, and uh, Macbeth after Duncan has been killed. Here it is, roll tape. Give me the daggers. <laughs> Sleeping in the dead are but as pictures, tis the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil. If he do bleed, I'll gild the faces of the grooms with all, for it must seem their guilt. Voices are knocking. How is it with me when every noise appalls me? What hands are here? Ah, they pluck out mine eyes. Will all great Neptune's ocean wash this blood clean from my hand? No. This my hand will rather the multitudinous seas incarnadine, making the green one red. My hands are of your colour, but I shame to wear a heart so white. I hear a knocking at the south entry. Retire we to our chamber, a little water clears us of this deed. How easy is it then? Your constancy hath left you unattended. Hark! More knocking! Put on your nightgown, lest occasion call us, and show us to be watchers. Be not lost so poorly in your thoughts. Um, in your new life, uh, will you do, I mean, how, how are you going to find um, what it is you most want to do? Uh, with, with, with patience, I think I need to put a gap between... Shakespeare. Uh, not necessarily Shakespeare, but perhaps running a major iconic arts organization mm. uh, and the next thing that I do. The demand on your time to do that between management, pure management, and art. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to do, to, to, to keep moving forward as an artist while addressing the queue of people needing answers exactly. outside the rehearsal yeah, exactly. room door. That's why. Right. It, 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 yeah, it, it, it is demanding. It is demanding. And I'm, I'm looking forward to being the irresponsible one uh, for a while. Uh, I, <laughs> it's not, I have it's not loved... my job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I have <laughs> loved running the RSC. I have loved being the father of a community. Mm. Uh, it's been an enormous privilege. And, of course, you are given for everything that you give. You get back ten times. Uh, because what it I, tells you about life and what it tells you about... Oh, just the generosity of people's hearts and mm. what, what, they, what they give as artists and as people back to you who are mm. 
may be constantly there feeling to, sorry for yourself need, about the queue outside yeah. the door. Their need to create. Yes, and their um, the energy that they generate uh, as a result of being given the opportunity to create. Um, and just to witness, to be, ha to be happy, to be lucky enough to have witnessed the coming together of people, that, that, that the whole has been greater than the sum of its parts. Mm. That we don't have to atomize into individualism. That it has been meaningful bringing people together. Uh, and that they have learnt from each other. It is possible to learn and make art at the same time. Do you time. want to make movies? Um, it's, it's, ne it's never been something that I've had um, the time to pursue so far. Um, it could be something that could come like a hunch in the... In, 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 the, in the gap that I hope will exist. I think you should write a memoir, and the title of the memoir ought to be Hunch. The Hunch. The Hunch. Yeah. <laughs> and have you thought about a memoir? I have only thought about a memoir in moments of... Um, Publishers calling you up. Vengeful anger. Really? Um, to get and, even with... Uh, what? And, and then, of course, that's the worst. Exactly. Who do you want to um, get even with? Oh, I wouldn't even dream of talking about that. Um, <laughs> but is there are, are there demons? Are there... No, not at all. But the, uh, inevitably, uh, uh, over ten years of, uh, of of the push and shove of running a some, major organisation, you know, some people that made your life more moment, difficult than it was necessary to be. Where, uh, uh, moments like of conflict. Um, <laughs> Did Shakespeare help in those moments? Yes, he preaches forgiveness <laughs> as the oh, absolute he? only answer, and uh, revenge as being the road to hell. Yeah. Vengeance and revenge is the road to hell. Absolutely, and so I, did, did I probably won't you? write those those, <laughs> those memoirs. So, so we shall expect to see you in and out of New York, and well, know. we are coming back as uh, a, 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 as a company shortly with our our, our musical Matilda, right. um, uh, which I, I think we'll probably uh, have to wait until the spring of two thousand and thirteen. Um, we're coming back to the Armoury next yeah. year with a production of King Lear for young people. And I'm sure I will personally be over for that. <coughs> and um, I, w I hope that there will be projects. One, one mad project I'm working on is um, a Western, a stage Western. Um, which with horses? I was, uh, with horses and... No, I don't think there will be live horses, which is a shame. Yeah. Um, it's, I, and I wouldn't rule them out. Um, the Victorian theatre, with, with its So what's the appeal belts, of the Western? The, the sense of, of people exposed to the elements, to themselves, to each yeah, other, right. the, the 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 conflict between different cultures—it's all there. Everything that was in Shakespeare, yeah. actually, you know, the, the 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 settlers and particularly amongst the the gold rush community, Shakespeare was a massively popular figure. There was a great deal of um, currency around Shakespeare uh, out west um, in the in the mid nineteenth century. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me.